So good morning. Welcome to Lecture 10 in the Acumatica Demo University. As many of you already know by now, my name is Richard Duffy. I have to keep reminding myself just in case I forget. It is Friday. It has been a long week. Um, my name is Richard Duffy. I am the Acumatica Product Evangelist. I'm also the Vice President of uh, Partner Strategy and Partner Enablement here at Acumatica. And the theme for today's Demo University is really this concept of no value equals no sale. Now, I was going to talk this week about business blueprints, but I've decided that because I've had so many discussions with different partners this week on a particular topic, um, then I, uh, I, I thought we would talk a little bit about this. And it's good to see we're getting some feedback in the chat already. Uh, and please keep that feedback coming. I might not necessarily be able to see it all as we talk, uh, but I will stop every once in a while and we'll address some of those particular topics. And then I'll also um, unmute the microphone because right now you're all muted, but I will unmute the microphone so we can have a little bit of an open discussion on this one because I think it's a good topic that certainly generates some, um, some different thoughts. So, yeah, today's focus is around no value equals no sale. So what's this whole concept of value about and what's our agenda uh, for today? Well, the agenda for today um, is I want to start off with uh, a did you know. Uh, then we want to talk a little bit about the concept of what is value. And then I'm going to ask you a potentially um, difficult question, threatening question. No, maybe not a threatening question, but one that's very difficult for people to answer. And I know it's difficult for people to answer because I've been doing quite a few business planning sessions with many different partners. Um, and when I ask this question, um, the, the answer is usually, uh, I don't know, I'm not sure. So we'll talk about that. Then I want to introduce you to some tools that are available for you for building a business case. And then we're going to talk a little bit about, um, about uh, next week's session, which is uh, the business blueprints. So. Did you know? Well, our did you know for today? Did you know that the biggest competitor that we often face in most sales cycles is not NetSuite, it's not Intact, it's not Microsoft, um, it's do nothing. It's do nothing. And one of the reasons why we face that challenge so many times is because the potential customer, the prospect, call them what you will, uh, customer in waiting, they have not seen enough of a reason for them to move forwards in the sales cycle with you. Now, it's kind of interesting. You think about it. You've just gone and you've done your demo. You've submitted your proposal. You've done a second demo. You've done a third demo. You run through the proposal. You've explained to them how much it's going to cost. You've explained to them why the cloud is so good. You've explained to them the features and functionality in the software. And yet, the customer will not commit. They just, for whatever reason, will not give you the order. Now, maybe you've asked for the order and they've delayed you. They said, we're not quite ready. Uh, we're not sure, I have to, you know, talk to the other members of the management team or whatever the case may be. But industry research shows and our anecdotal research and certainly my experience over the last 25 years of selling accounting software and, and then, of course, enterprise resource planning, that experience shows that nine times out of ten, when a sales cycle is delayed, then it's because the customer does not see value. They do not see what it is that your solution is going to deliver that is going to justify them making the investment that you're asking them to make. So what's value? Well, I'm going to um, get a little bit interactive here for a second, and I'm going to open up our microphone. So please, um, if you are in a noisy environment and you are not participating in the discussion, I'm going to ask you to mute your phone. Um, but I'm going to open up the uh, I'm going to open up the phone for everybody else. So 
All right, so hello everyone. So we've, uh, we've now opened up the phone. And uh, hopefully you're not having a conversation about something else. You are focused on what we're talking about. Well, that, that's not working. <laughs> All right. It's funny, I was just telling my wife the other day, I said, I always like to open up the microphone partway through my presentations and see how many people are actually listening and how many people are talking amongst themselves about what they saw last week on television or what they're going to do on the weekend. Um, so let's try it a different way. I'm going to ask the question, what do you think is value? And then what I'd like you to do is if you want to answer the question, if you want to give me your definition of value, please raise your hand and I will unmute your microphone. So we'll try this way. What do you think, what is value? Well, give me a definition of value, anyone. Okay, Graham, I knew I could count on you. So let's just unmute you and Graham, you have the microphone. What is value? Graham, you're unmuted, so maybe you need to unmute at your end as well. Hello, Graham. Unfortunately, we can't hear you, but uh, anyway, I'm not sure what's happening there, Graham. Maybe your headset is still muted or your phone is muted or your computer is muted, but anyway. I'm going to put you back on mute from here, but I've got um, I've got a couple of suggestions in the chat. So thank you for for using the available technology. So um, we've got uh, from Michael Lupro. Michael says value is defined by the client, and it can have a wide variety of flavors. Well, you're absolutely right. Value is always defined by your customer. Uh, and as Michael quite rightly says, a sale occurs when the perceived value exceeds the cost. Uh, Carlos has said um, um, worthiness. Yep. So that's uh, Carlos Ibarra says it's uh, value is about worthiness. Yep. It's worthwhile spending my money. Uh, Graham, who uh, is actually typing now, says he, he thinks value is when um, whatever it is that you're offering makes people's lives easier. Well, all those things I would tend to agree with, um, but I think the most important piece here, uh, when your solution aligns to a customer's problem, well, yep, you're right, Dinesh, uh, your solution does align to a customer problem. But you know what? What if the, um, the return, what if the financial return that they get from solving that problem does not exceed the cost of solving the problem. So it's a zero-sum game. Um, if I solve this problem, I'm going to save $90,000. But um, it's going to cost me $90,000 to implement the solution. So the zero-sum is it's, it's, it's basically there is, no, there is no net value increase to the customer. Think about the proposal that you put in. When you put in a proposal to your customer, what do you include in it? You probably include a statement of what the software is, what the modules are that you're going to um, give them. You're probably also going to explain what's going to happen during the implementation process. But one of the things that I've seen is that many proposals don't actually provide a breakdown of specifically what it is that the customer is going to gain as a result of purchasing the software. Now, it might explain what they're going to get in terms of licenses and services, but Again, as I said, unfortunately, it doesn't necessarily explain what the net value will be. 
So again, some good, um, some good uh, feedback here. Another one, value is provided when your solution resolves a series of issues that you've discovered from your interviews. They start by looking for something, but interviews will generally expose more things that the potential customer finds important, and listening is key. So Michael, good, um, good feedback, and you're absolutely right. Value is provided when your solution resolves um, those issues and resolves them with a positive financial gain. So when I say net value, great question uh, from Nancy. When I say net value, what do I mean? Do I mean dollars or key areas of improvement? Well, I actually mean both, and the two are incredibly tightly linked because a key area of improvement is, has to generate some kind of dollar impact. A lot of the time when we talk about building a value proposition, and you talk about our value proposition, a value proposition is our statement of what it is that we're going to deliver in terms of value. Um, people have a value proposition where they say, uh, our value proposition is that we will help you streamline operations and gain visibility. Well, kind of nice, but it's a little bit generic. Well, what do you mean streamline operations? And do I really you know, what's the net benefit of streamlining operations? People will never do something just, well, most people won't do something just for the sake of doing it, okay? Um, there usually has to be, particularly when we're talking about the kinds of investments that we're asking people to make in IT, there typically has to be some kind of return. So, let's say, for example, you say we're going to stream, we're going to help you optimize your inventory management. Well, what does that mean? What do you mean by optimizing your inventory management? Well, what I want to know is what specifically are you going to deliver in terms of that optimization? Now you might say, well, optimizing inventory management, well, that means that we're going to um, increase your number of inventory turns or we're going to reduce the amount of time it takes for you to pick orders, or we're going to help you reduce the number of incorrect shipments that you make. So all those things are great, and they are good statements to make uh, in the mind of the prospect. Uh, and they are good statements to make because that's fundamentally what we want to do, right? We want to help the prospective customer improve their business processes. But then when it comes time to put the proposal down on paper, then you know it's, it's really, really important to help the customer understand how much that's going to help them save or make. Now, this isn't an easy thing to do. And, and Nancy, good point there. Nancy's just said, and you, hopefully you're all able to see the chat as it's coming through. Uh, can you all see the chat as they're coming through when somebody chats with the entire audience? Hopefully you can. Um, yep, so don't forget in the Goto uh, training interface, you can actually go ahead and you can pop that chat pod out by just clicking on the little expand and then you can uh, spread that out. Because I'm not giving you death by PowerPoint today. This is the only slide I'm pretty much using. Um, so feel free to take up the space with the chat. But um, you need to be able to put a dollar value against it. Why? Because you have to be able to show the customer what the financial return on their investment is going to be. Let's talk about how you do that. Now, I realize, and a couple of people have said, well, it's very difficult to get the customer to articulate the dollars that are involved here. So, for example, if you said to the customer, all right, as a result of implementing Acumatica, we are going to help you do some analysis of your picking and packing, and then off the back end of that, using our knowledge and our skill, we're going to make recommendations for you on a better way to structure your warehouse. So we're going to show you which of your products 
turn the fastest, which of your products ship the most often, so that you can then rearrange your warehouse and reduce the amount of time involved in picking. You then have to ask the customer, if we were able to do that, if we were able to reduce the amount of time it takes to do your picking by 25%, what would be the impact of that? And this is where, and this is something I'm good at, this is where asking dumb questions can be really, really helpful. So asking questions like, you know, when they say, well, I think it would certainly reduce the amount of time it takes to do the picking by 20%. And I would say, and how does that help you? And then they might say, well, it means that we can pick more orders more quickly. And, and how does that help you? Well, we could um, get our orders shipped faster. And then what could you do with that time that you'd saved? All right, well, maybe we could actually uh, get those people who are involved in the picking process to work on some other tasks. Well, what other tasks do you think you could get them to work on? Uh, maybe we could do our put away faster. Maybe we could do, um, maybe we could do implement a, a quality checking process to make sure that our orders get double checked. And now this is part of your challenge is you need to know enough about the business processes that they're talking about to be able to make suggestions, right? But it's always better if they come up with them, but if you can make suggestions. So if you can then say, if we could do that, if we could take that time that you've now freed up and get one of your um, order picking people to actually spend their time validating, their, validating the orders, what do you think would be the impact of that? How many orders right now do you ship out that are incorrect? And then hopefully they'll be able to tell you, well, we ship out on average X. Um, or they might say, you know what, we really don't know. Well, that in and of itself is, um, is, a, is a key thing that you can help them address. So let's take those two examples. Let's say um, that they say to you, well, we don't know. We don't know um, how many orders uh, we get returns for because they're incorrectly shipped. So what can you do? Well, if they don't know, you can go out and you can do some research. Let's actually try it. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna get a little bit uh, little get a little bit um, out there with this. Now, can you see my web browser? Hopefully, everyone can see my web browser right now. Okay, can you see it now? No, no, still no's. All right, so it looks like our problem with Internet Explorer has come back. There was a problem with um, GoToMeeting and GoToWebinar that if you were trying to share out, um, if you were trying to share out uh, Internet Explorer, it didn't work. So let's go for Google Chrome. So please stand by. <clears throat> let's go into our Google Chrome. And now you should be able to see uh, my web browser. Yes? Happy days. All right. So what you can do is you can go and you can start searching for metrics. All right. So what would I search for? Um, okay. Um, number, number of incorrect shipments average. Now this may end up with no result, okay? But let's take a look. All right, on time shipping, shipping and delivery questions, shipping and returns, shipping issues and problems. Okay, how does free shipping work? Right, nothing much here. We're getting a lot of information from people about how they deal with their um, 
Okay, how do they deal with those problems? Maybe we need to ask the question a little bit differently. Orders and shipping, 12 ideas to lower shipping costs. Okay, um, statistics. If I add the word statistics, see what we get here. Shopping cart abandonment, reducing the rate of returns. An introduction to statistics for engineers. All right, trucking statistics. All right, we're not finding it, but what I'm going to do is um, I am going to go ahead and I'm going to do some more searching rather than have you watching, the sh watching this information because I guarantee you the information that we're looking for Will be uh, will be out there somewhere. Somebody will have a statistic um, for what are the um, the number of uh, incorrect um, searches. Oh, we've got another. Somebody looks like they might have found one. So let's click on that. Shipping problems quantify errors. All right. So again, the secret with Google is asking the right question. Quantifying the costs and assessing. All right, very good. So let's take a look at this one. Uh, okay, that's the year 2000 software problem. That's really not what we want. Warehouse metrics, measure what matters. So here we go. Here's the inbound logistics. So here is some information. All right. So here we go. The perfect order. Perfect order is a calculation of the error-free rate of each stage of a purchase order. Data is then calculated. Additional metrics to consider. What's in stock? Good. So I'm getting quite a few um, uh, links coming through on the chat. So everybody gets the idea that I'm trying to model here. So you know what this is really about. This is really about um, and here's another one, fulfillment accuracy, perception versus reality. So thanks, Nancy, for, um, for sending that one through. So again, the information that you need is out there. All right? So you then take that information and you say, well, you know what? On average, based on some research that we have done, we know that um, on average 20% or 15% um, are you know uh, of all returns are are um, you know related to incorrect packing or shipping. So then you could say if we were to able able to reduce that by fifteen percent or by twenty percent or by a hundred percent, what would be the impact of that to you? All right. So it's a matter of drilling down to find out that information. You can see Graham's just pointed out that um, product returns cost manufacturers and retailers more than $100 billion per year. And he's actually provided um, a document that has um, a link from Sloan, MIT Sloan, uh, talking about product returns. Can product returns make you money? There you go, perfect. Many companies see customers' product returns as a major inconvenience and an eroder of profits. After all, product returns cost manufacturers and retailers more than $100 billion per year, or an average loss per company of about 3.8% in profit. Okay, so um, here's the link. Let me copy that. And just um, FYI, anybody, if you do send a link to something that's uh, useful, as long as it's not a link to something dubious and you're just trying to catch me out, um, just make sure you send those um, to everybody, all right? Uh, and then that way everyone can benefit from them. So there is the link uh, in the chat to this particular review document. So again, this is the thing. What, what we're talking about, what we're focused on, is delivering this concept of value. Now, you're actually, when you go and you do this research, when you go and you um, get this information, you provide these documents, you you become more valuable to your customer. Why? Because what are you doing? You're now in a position where you are starting to become an advisor. 
you're starting to become a business advisor. Now, we all know the disclaimers that go with being a business advisor. You don't want to be a business advisor because you know, then they're going to sue you if you give them incorrect advice and so on and so forth. But you know, there are always caveats you can put on this. But what you're fundamentally trying to do here is you're trying to come up with a list of all of these different specific areas where you can, um, you can make a specific financial difference. Now, this is one of the biggest challenges that people face as, as salespeople and as pre-salespeople because we know what our software does, right? You're all experts on what the software does. And let's be brutally honest. When it comes to the core functionality in most software, in most ERP software, when you look at that core functionality, most products do roughly the same thing. All right? I can use some very basic software with a little bit of extra work, right? It's just the amount of work that's involved differs to, 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 to start calculating some of these things and to start delivering some of these things. Let's take another one. You ask a prospective customer, well, what's your annual sales? And they might say, our annual sales are $20 million. And then you say to them, well, at the end of every month, what is your average day's sales outstanding? And they might say, well, our average day's sales outstanding is 60 days. And then you ask them, and what's that as a value? Well, they say, well, at any given point in time, that represents a million dollars in debtors. So then you ask them, all right. So, a million dollars in debtors, what is that costing you? How do you fund that? Okay, um, and there's a good chance that if they're in wholesale and distribution, which is an area where I know many of you are focused, there's a good chance they've got a bank overdraft, they've got some kind of line of credit, and all of their unsold inventory that's sitting on their shelves, um, all of their debtors is being funded somehow, either through a line of credit or by careful and effective management of cash flow, or whatever the case may be. Um, so you can ask them, well, if we were able to reduce the amount of time it takes for you to get paid, what do you think would be the impact of that? Well, I think it would probably help us get the money in earlier. All right, well, let's talk about some of the things that we can do to help you do that. Now you start having a discussion about functionality in the software that's directly linked to solving a business problem. Hopefully when you go and talk to a prospect, they're going to have a list of their standard problems already. You know, this is what we want to do. You know, our existing software is getting too old, the vendor is retiring support, all of those kinds of things. They're going to, they're going to present those and they're going to lay them down for you on a piece of paper and make your life easy. But my experiences have been that happens in maybe 40 to 45 percent of all sales scenarios. You are always going to be looking for those additional silver bullets that's going to help you um, convince the customer that your solution is the right one. So then that's what you need to do. So this is where, um, as Michael said earlier, asking those questions is critical. And you know, structuring those questions in a way that gets the right answers um, is also critical because this isn't about conducting a tax audit, right? Um, and oftentimes you actually have to build trust before you can start asking some of these questions. So this is where doing some of this research is going to be really, really helpful. All right. So um, what I'm going to do is I am going to start collect, collecting some of these documents and I'm going to um, start sharing them out through the sales toolkit. Okay, so um, here we go. Here's another piece of feedback uh, from Michael. Once I implemented a solution that reduced the time it took to build customers from six to eight weeks, oh my God, to one day after payroll was posted. That allowed the company to reduce an outstanding line of credit from 4.2 million to zero. So Michael, I'm going to ask you the next obvious question. Hopefully you've got that in some kind of documented case study with a customer testimonial. Because I tell you, if you can deliver that kind of value, then you know making sales of that solution to companies who have a similar challenge 
we're, and I guarantee if you look at that industry, companies of a similar size in a similar industry, you'll probably find more that have the same problem. You've now got a lay down mazare. You can just walk out and do an entire marketing campaign, a telemarketing campaign, a demand generation campaign, just around that one case study and that one theme alone. Because that is awesome. Think of how much um, you would have saved them. Now, this is where, I'm going off on a tangent, but you're probably used to this by now. This is where, if you have a really good understanding of this and you're prepared to do it, one of the things that you can do is start moving to value-based billing. Now, I don't know how many of you were actually at the summit and you heard our analyst panel, but this is one of the things that they were talking about. As a matter of fact, we are now competing with solutions that that's how they charge for the software. All right, I think it's, um, I'm trying to think of the name of the product. It's not Plex, uh, it's another one of the new um, cloud products and it's based on the person's name the name of the founder of the company. But anyway, um, doesn't matter. They are now selling the software on the basis of the additional value delivered from the implementation of the software. So they'll sit down and they'll say, okay, here are all the problems you have today. Um, here are all the issues that we think if you um, use our software correctly that you can resolve. And here's how much we think we can save you. So let's do a benchmark on how things are right now. And then we're going to benchmark you in three months, six months, nine months, and 12 months. And we're just going to charge you a percentage of the additional business, the additional profitability that you generate as a result of using our software. Strange but true. Hard to manage, but apparently they're doing it. Apparently they're doing it. And they're doing it with mid-size organizations, mid-size organizations, and large enterprises. So, again, you can take this information, this knowledge, and turn it, uh, turn it into something really, really powerful. So then, how can you summarize all of that? How can you pull all of that together? And how can you build a value-based business case? So let's talk about that for a second. What is a value-based business case? Well, a value-based business case is fundamentally a statement of everything you're going to save them and all the additional revenue they're going to make as a result of deploying your software because when they deploy your software, the following things will happen. We'll reduce your debtors by X percent. We'll reduce your um, inventory, um, your inventory holdings by Y percent. By implementing our inventory optimization solution, we're going to reduce your inventory from one million dollars down to, you know, five hundred thousand. All right. So what are you going to do with that five hundred thousand dollars of additional free cash flow? Well, potentially you'll be able to pay your suppliers sooner. So if you could pay your suppliers sooner, could you get settlement discounts? That's then going to reduce the amount that you actually end up paying for your products that you're buying to resell. Well, what would that mean? Well, that's going to mean that our profitability is going to increase by X percent. Your job is to be the diagnoser of these challenges. And it's not easy, right? It's not easy. And for new salespeople, this is the biggest challenge because they don't understand what, what, what's happening in the business. So your consultants can help you. So then what do you do? How do you summarize all of this? Well. Hopefully by now, many of you have access to the um, Evernote uh, Acumatica Channel Sales Toolkit. And this is what we're looking at right now. This is actually the marketing toolkit, but if I look at the sales toolkit, one of the documents that you're going to see inside the toolkit is if we scroll down, you are going to see a document uh, and let me just do a quick sync, make sure the version that I have on this computer is up to date because it looks like it hasn't synced for a while. So let's just let that happen. But one of the documents that you're going to find in there is called an ROI-based business case builder. 
And yep, Jacqueline, I saw your message. You're still waiting for access. My bad. Um, I will give you access immediately after this session. I got flooded with so many emails requesting access. I do have to come up with a better way of making sure that those don't slip through the cracks. So I'm thinking about how I can do that. Um, but yeah, if you haven't received access, just drop me an email. Or you can also email Charlie Horton at, um, at Acumatica. And I'm going to give you his email address as well. Charlie, as you know, is our partner programs manager. Um, and as I keep telling him, he's my number one guy. Uh, he's my go-to person to help me um, get some of these things done. So if you email Charlie Horton as well, um, if, uh, if you still haven't received it, email either of us, both of us. One way or the other, you'll get access. But anyway, in the toolkit, you'll find there is an ROI calculator. So let's take a look at it. Let's double click on the Excel spreadsheet and open it up. And so now, hopefully, um, you can see the, um, the Excel spreadsheet. Let me just double check. Can you see the Excel spreadsheet? Yes, no, maybe, perhaps. Yes, thank you, Jorge. All right, so how did I find this document? Well, all I did was I did a, uh, a search for ROI-based business case or ROI tools. Um, and this is one that, funnily enough, we're actually working with Nucleus Research here at Acumatica. Uh, and this is a free one that they put together. Now, where do you think I got this one from? Well, I actually got it from ZDNet, um, the, the publishers of many different um, IT-related documents, magazines, um, all kinds of things. So here is uh, ROI financial analysis tool specifically designed for enterprise resource planning. All right, so they've got a um, tutorial here. If this is your first time using the tool, consider visiting the tutorial using the button above. So then you click on the button, and where does it take you? Well, it then takes you out to um, a website. Well, and then that website's not coming up, so I need to have a look at that. Maybe their site's down at the moment but I will provide you with a link to that tutorial because um, the person who built this is a lady called Rebecca Wedderman and Rebecca was actually one of the analysts who was with us at our summit. So I'll contact her and make sure I've got the right link for you. But basically what you do is you go in here and you enter in your basic financial information. So what's the customer name? What's the name of the project? Have they given it a project name? Um, have they given it a, a date when the project's going to start? What are their financial assumptions? And you'll see, okay, um, there are notes and notations here giving you some explanations as to what you need to put in. This is the total effective tax rate. What's the discount rate? This is the corporate discount or borrowing rate. And it's used in the net present value and internal rate of return calculation. So if you're sitting there going, well, hang on, what's an NPR and an IRR? That's net present value and internal rate of return. These are metrics that finance people use to calculate the real cost of something, the real cost of money, all right? But if you use this, you don't need to worry about those calculations because the software is going to make the calculations for you. So you can put in... Um, your licenses. How many software licenses are you purchasing? So now, if you're selling SaaS, you're selling Acumatica, you're not actually selling any licenses per se. We don't charge per number of users. So you can just put in one, okay, and you can then put in the total value of the, um, of the software license. All right, so let's say it's $50,000. 50, one, two, three. And then you can check here if this is a capital expense that should be depreciated because that's obviously going to have a big impact. What is the cost of the hardware purchase for the project? Well, if it's SaaS, you can put in potentially zero. But now here's a scenario where you can do um, uh, two different versions of this. One where they have to put it on premise and one where they put it um, in the cloud. So let's say the cost of the hardware is zero. 
and the initial cost of consulting is, let's say it's $40,000. Okay, how many IT staff will work on implementing the project? So let's say, um, let's say, and again, it does not have to relate to IT staff, okay? You can look at this and say, how many staff in total? How many people are going to work on implementing the project? So maybe they're going to have two full-time equivalents who are going to spend a total of, let's say, eight weeks. So eight weeks is four eights are 32. So that's 320 hours okay, per person is going to spend on this. All right. And what's the average fully loaded salary of your staff? Let's say I'm paying them on average $75,000. Okay, got it so far? How many IT staff will be assigned to ongoing system maintenance? Well, in a SaaS environment, potentially it's zero. Okay, or you could say, you know what? Um, how many IT staff? Well, I think it's going to take somebody maybe 10% of their time in total to manage the system, all right? Um, or we'll just say zero, okay? There's not going to be any because we're operating in a SaaS environment. So then you start looking at this in the expensing of the software. So you've got year one, year two, year three, and so on and so forth, right? So depending on whether or not you're capitalizing it, or you are um, uh, expensing it, that will depend on what you get in here. So, what are we looking at? We're now looking at a calculation here of all of these values, including your personnel, your hardware, your software, your consulting. All right, what about training costs? So now you can go in here and you can start putting in the costs of training. Any other um, costs involved in the implementation. Well, you can put those in here and then you go next. All right, now comes the difficult part because you should know all of those other things already. The difficult part is then saying, okay, what do you think we're going to save? So if your average annual inventory, let's say, is $1 million is your average, whoop, um, one zero short. One, one, two, three, four, five, six million dollars. Okay, what do you think is the percentage reduction? And this is what you know. You know that if they do these three things that you are going to um, help them. One second, I can see a hand's gone up. I just want to make sure everyone can still see everything. Yep, no, we're good. So um, you can say, you know what, I think we're going to help them save, reduce their average inventory by 25%. What's their increased productivity? Well, I think as a result of doing these four or five things, we give them CRM, we give them you know, all these other tools, we think that for the five people in the accounting team, who have an average loaded cost of $75,000 each, we think we're going to help them generate a 15% productivity increase. All right. Any other direct benefits? So now we can go in here and we can start punching in some other direct benefits. Increased profits from distributors, increased cross-selling Reduced returns handling costs. Well, we think we can actually help them save, um, you know, $10,000. Okay, now note, this is a three-year um, return, all right? So we're just looking at for the next three years. And then you go through this process, all right? Indirect benefits. What are some of the indirect benefits? Well, where do we get some of these indirect benefits? Reduced admin overhead, reduced marketing costs, reduced product rework, um, improved technology management, improved process management. So the questions are all here, the things that you want to focus on. You just need to figure out what are the questions I'm going to ask. What are the things I can do 
with my software, with my solution that has an impact on each of these areas. All right? And then um, you can do a calculation of the value of productivity. You can do a calculation of a change in the working capital. Right, so let's say you can say our annual billings are 20, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And then my counts receivable days before technology is 90, or let's say, let's be reasonable, 50. Expected accounts receivable days after the technology is, um, I don't know, uh, Let's be let's be optimistic. Let's say let's just say it's forty, okay. And cost of capital, right? What's my annual interest rate? What am I paying for, for my funding? Let's leave it at fifteen percent. Just there alone, you can potentially by getting a ten a ten day reduction in their average day sales outstanding, you can save them eighty two thousand dollars. Next, all right. So then we go in here, and now we're looking at um, our calculation. Okay, these are some of our financial assumptions. So the benefits, the costs, and then the financial impact of this. So you're delivering a cumulative rate of return over three years of 109%. All right, so the net cash flow impact, the annual ROI, the annual ROI of the direct benefits, you've now got all of that put in here, and then you can go next. And now it's generating automatically an executive summary for you that you can go ahead and print out and include, along with some graphs, okay, all the costs, all the benefits, okay, all graphed out for you, detailed financial results, all validated. This isn't made up. This is all correct, okay, with some uh, information that um, you can point them back to. What's the value of internal rate of return? What's the value of cumulative ROI? All right? And then you can now print this document out and incorporate it into your proposal. You now have a value-based business case. All right? So that's where you're at right now. You've now generated your report, and you're all good to go. And you can sit here, and you can look at all your graphs. Here's all your graphs for you. If you just want to grab one of these graphs and put it into your own proposal, that's all calculated out there for you. All right? How hard is that? Do you think that's difficult? Do you think this tool will help you do an ROI-based business case. Yes, no. Feel free to put something in the chat. No one's going to make a commitment. Oh, it looks really great. Thanks, Jorge. Um, Paul, absolutely. Um, Nancy's got Nancy's got a question mark there. Yes, but our competitors are doing the same thing. How do we differentiate our ROI? All right, great question, Jacqueline. If you're um, if your uh, competitors are doing the same thing, how do you differentiate your ROI? Well, do you know for a fact that your competitors are doing the same thing? If you do and you're absolutely 100% sure, that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Our differentiation of ROI comes down to how well you implement the software and how well you know the business how well you know the industry. If you know nothing about manufacturing and you're doing your very first manufacturing sale, how much do you know about improving business processes for manufacturers? Probably not a heck of a lot. Now, I'm not saying this is the case for you, Jacqueline, or for anybody else. But this is one of the advantages of specialization. This is one of the advantages of taking some kind of vertical focus to be able to build up some kind of knowledge set um, on what is best practice in an industry, okay? And then you apply that best practice. So yes, everyone has the capability to do an ROI-based business case, but it's how well you can execute it that matters and how well you've done it in the past. Talk is cheap, 
Lots of people can come in and say, oh, we're going to deliver this and we're going to deliver that. Well, guess what? If you present this, um, if you present this value-based business case to me, I'm going to say, well, that's all good and I believe you and I understand it and that's all great, but tell me, how am I going to, how am I going to justify this? Okay, prove to me that you're going to deliver all these results. Yes, you've shown me on paper what you're going to do. Tell me about the sites where you've done this before. Tell me about the scenarios where you've, um, where you've achieved these results for other people. So that's the important part. So with that, I'm going to kind of wrap up because we're right on our finishing time. But I do want to remind you, hopefully this has been a good usage of your time today. Hopefully, you're going to at least try the value-based business case. Go back, think about some of the other companies that you've implemented systems for. Try and do a value-based business case in reverse, all right? Ask them, what was the benefit that you got from implementing our software? You have to start thinking about this. Well, you don't have to do anything, I tell you, actually. You can say, Richard, you're an idiot. Um, it's all very well for you to sit there in your nice office in Kirkland and you know give us lectures about how all this stuff works. Um, but I, I can tell you I've done this. I ran my own partner business for, for 13 years. I've been working with partners on this process, using this process um, with partners and working with partners who don't use the process. I guarantee you, if you do this, if you start building value-based business cases, your sales cycles will shorten and your win rate will go up, okay? But anyway, let's go back now to our Evernote. One of the things we're going to do next week is we are going to spend some time looking at our business uh, blueprint system. And we're going to talk about how you can start using the business blueprint system to help you in your sales cycles. Question was just asked, the Evernote library, is the material also in the partner portal? Some of it is, some of it isn't. All right, I maintain the Evernote library because in all honesty, my experience has been after many, many years of working with vendors, this is the best way of sharing information with you as a sales force, right, because all you have to do is have access to the system. I published it in here. It synchronizes automatically to you. You don't have to go looking for anything. I just publish it and it's there, right? You don't have to go digging through portal pages. I just share the stuff that I think is valuable, all right? Um, so again, by the end of this weekend, you'll also have all of the um, all of the customer case studies that we have available, they'll be, they'll be populated in here. So again, reach out to me, reach out to Charlie. Uh, we'll be more than happy to add you to the, um, to, the, to the toolkit. Just need to have an Evernote account. And next week, Charlie and I are going to show you uh, via live video stream how, um, um, how to use these. So we're going we're gonna to set up a live broadcast. Uh, and he's going to be a prospect, I'm going to be a salesperson, and I'm going to um, take him through an Acumatica uh, discussion um, using the business blueprints. All right, so with that, I'd like to uh, wish you an enjoyable rest of day, um, and I look forward to speaking with you next week in the Demo University, and again, remember, this session will be up and available for you in the next couple of hours for you to review uh, and have a great weekend. And I hope your respective football teams uh, have a successful one as well. Thanks and goodbye.